Um, yeah, bring it with you. There should be several days worth of notes in there. Some of those are going to be handy for you all. Um, so I encourage you to have those. It'll kind of follow along with each time we're together this week. Um, and hopefully it's helpful as we follow along, as we open God's Word, and uh, we do this. So um, I ask that you would pray with me one more time before we dive into this. Father, uh, God, I, I thank you that we can come to your Word. Um, Lord, I thank you for this week that we have ahead of us, this time where we can, we can look at revival. It's time that we set aside each year to say, Lord, revive us again. Uh, Lord, and I ask that you would do that work as only you can. Uh, but Lord, I pray that as we consider revival, as we consider what revival looks like in, in our lives and in our marriages and in our families, God, I, I, I pray that you would give us a, a renewed vision to see what revival really is and how it's accomplished. Uh, so Lord, as we ask this question, are we doing this right? I, I pray that you would be in it that you would teach us, uh, that, we would, that we would grow in the likeness of Jesus and just more and more follow you faithfully. So Lord, help us this week, we pray, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, <sighs> Revival Week. Y'all, this is the first time I've ever done this, so this is, this is interesting. It's, it feels like a Sunday morning, doesn't it? That's wild. Wild. Well, this is going to look a little bit different than normal. Um, uh, it'll have some similarities, but it'll, it's going to be a little bit different than normal because rather than saying open to this text and we're going to walk through it line by line, um, we're actually going to begin covering a topic. Um, and I don't preach topically all that often, so this is a little bit of a different exercise for me. Um, it, again, similar, but it's a little bit different. Um, and I really genuinely hope that you can be here each night because each night one thing is going to build on the next and hopefully we can see the conclusion uh, Wednesday night um, as we consider what the church does as a result of revival. Um, <clears throat> so I really hope that you can be here each night. I'm also a realist. I, all, I know that you all have lives um, and you got stuff going on and some of you all it's going to be difficult to say yeah, I'm going to commit the next four nights and I'm going to be here on time every time sitting there ready to listen and t like... Just going to be laser focused. Um, Y'all, I get it. I get it. Um, so what I would encourage you to do is uh, they're going to be posted online. We'll do a podcast version. I'd encourage you to listen to them because um, I, I really do believe that this is something that's going to be beneficial uh, for us as the church. Um, and what I thought I would do since, you know, it's revival week, I thought we'd do a really, really intriguing topic. Y'all ready for this one? Revival. <laughs> Revival. What is revival? That's what we're going to ask. We're going to say, what is revival? And then we're going to ask, are we doing it right? Like if we want revival, are we doing this thing the way we should be? And then we're going to ask the question, whenever we experience revival, what does that look like in the lives of individuals? What does it look like in the life of my marriage? What does it look like in the life of my family? What does it look like in the life of the church? Uh, so we're going to try our best to look at all of these different facets. And our aim, our aim is going to be to look at and try to understand this thing that we call revival. Now, I do want to start with a quick understanding because uh, I will draw a distinction between revival and awakening. Um, so I, I just want to define terms real quick before we ever dive into this, um, because I believe revival, revival assumes that you have been alive, right? You can't be revived until you've been vived. That's not a word, but you get the point. Um, and I stole that from somebody else. It's not my joke. I, yeah, straight up stole that one. So revival assumes that you've been alive before, and it's a, like a, a reawakening. We're being revived again. There's a, a, a new religious fervor, uh, a new passion, a new fire. Um, so that's what we think of whenever we think of revival. Now, there is also awakening. Awakening would be for the person who is not a believer, and they are coming to know Christ for the first time. Okay. Now, the reason I bring that up is because I honestly don't believe you can have one without the other. If you have revival you will see awakenings. You see awakening, you'll see revival. Those two things go together. Um, and hopefully throughout this week, we'll see why those two things go together. And my hope and my aim and my prayer for, I don't know, the last couple months has been that both of those will happen this week. That people will be revived and we will see some awakened. 
Um, I want to see people come to know Christ, but I certainly want to see Christians with a renewed passion. Um, so that's my aim over this week, that we experience revival in the church and we see awakening in our community. Um, and the way I would like to start each gathering is by, uh, <clears throat> by looking at historic revivals. Um, I think it's a good place to start, and hopefully by the end of this morning you'll see why I think it's a good place to start. Um, it, now, understand, I'm going to start in the, in the 1700s. Does that mean that there was never revival before that? Of course not. Of course not. We just have some really good historical accounts of those that have happened over the last four to five hundred years, which is why I want to look at those. And I'd like to start this morning by looking at the first Great Awakening. Um, in the early 1700s, in America, religious interest had begun to fade. Uh, most, of you, most of you have studied any kind of history. You know that the Americas uh, were populated and colonies established largely on religious freedom. And it was one of the key markers to the colony settlement. But by the early 1700s, that had begun to fade. And rather than holding on to religious beliefs in the West, people had begun to trade them in, in favor of science and reason. And they said the two things are not compatible, so we're going to give up religion, we're going to follow science and reason. By the way, they are not incompatible. So, although the American colonies had originally been a place where people held to deep religious convictions, that was slowly beginning to fade, and there was a sort of feeling of this feeling of religious indifference. Um, rather than holding on to the faith of their fathers, they were exchanging it for something else. Oftentimes, what is now known as deism. Um, and deism is essentially a belief that a god or gods created the universe, but it rejects any kind of claim that you can know that creator or those creators, uh, rejects all religious authority or any kind of divine revelation. Essentially what deism says is all you can know is what's observable in nature. That's all you can know. By the way, Paul says you can see that there must be an all-powerful creator just by looking at creation, right? Go read Romans 1 and you'll see it. But it was into this, this religious enlightenment era that we see some of the most famous preachers of all time. They stepped onto the scenes and they had this passion, this fire, and they were unapologetic about what they believed. And they were unapologetic in claiming that their God created all things and that you could know him personally in the person and work of Jesus. And they proclaimed it. Um, we saw heroes like Jonathan Edwards, who saw hundreds, hundreds come to profess Christ. And he's sometimes known as America's first theologian. Uh, Edwards stepped on the scene. Then we see guys like George Whitfield, who wasn't really a theologian like Edwards was, but he was this fiery preacher who saw thousands, who saw thousands of people converted to the Christian faith. There are people like John and Charles Wesley, these brothers who wrote hymns. They preached to hundreds of thousands of people. They trained itinerant preachers who preached to hundreds of thousands of more people. Um, and they, so they trained them, they preached in outdoor revivals, and then they became the founders of the Methodist movement. And at this time, at this time of this first great awakening, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people professed Christ as Lord. My question then became, why? Why did this happen? Why did they see this awakening? Why did they see this revival? Why? And I think that's a good question to ask because I know many of you have prayed for revival. Many of you have wanted revival. So why did they see it? What was around them that, they, that, that caused this thing? Well, the first answer, most of you aren't, aren't going to like this one because the answer is because God moved. Because God did a work. Like, that's why this happened. Because God did something in people. God did what only God can do. And honestly, if we want to see revival, the first thing we need to do is start asking God to do what only God can do. Um, God is the one who has to author this thing. Um, I think what we need to do as we look for revival is actually echo the words of Habakkuk 3.2. We looked at just a few months ago over here at the school. Like I still remember where we were at, and I can still see some of y'all sitting there as we read Habakkuk 3.2, where it says, Lord, I have heard the report about you. Lord, I stand in all of your deeds. Revive your work in these years. Make it known in these years. In your wrath, remember mercy. I think just like Habakkuk, we need to begin to pray that God would revive his work in these years. Asking God to do what only God can do. Honestly, I, first of all, let me just say, I'm not the best preacher in the world. Even if I was, I cannot preach a good enough sermon that's going to make you be like, oh man, Jared convinced me. 
I could do all the convincing in the world, but if God doesn't do it, you're not going to experience revival. We need God to do what only God can do, so let's ask God to do what only God can do. Why else did they experience this? Well, because certain men were revived by the Spirit of God through the Word of God to do the work of God. And that's significant, again, that's significant enough, I want to read it again. Certain men were revived by the Spirit of God through the Word of God to do the work of God. Because God revived a few, many people experienced awakening. Many people did. Now, <clears throat> that naturally led me to think about our circumstances, where we're at. How could God use the revival, like a few revived people, to impact our community, our country? How could God use a few people to impact the world? How could God raise up more Whitfields? Or Wesley's. How could God do that? How could he use a few to impact the world? Like, how could God use revival in your life? Or in your marriage? How could God use revival in your family? Or in the church? How could God use that? And I think the answer is, uh, as we've already mentioned once today, he could do abundantly and exceedingly more than you could ask or imagine. Um, whatever you have in mind that God might be able to do with your revival, uh, it's not big enough. It's just not. God can do more than we can imagine. Um, now, some of you, I think few of you, but, but some of you may be asking, do we really need like a whole new, brand new revival? Like, do we need to be revived? And I think that there is numerical evidence that says, yes, absolutely, we need to be revived. Um, and some of this is printed in your booklets. Um, uh, First of all, let me start by saying there needs to be an awakening in our country. There was a Gallup poll done in 2021 that said 69% of Americans said they were Christians. However, I believe that the evidence suggests that that's a lar largely just a nominal Christianity and not a real faith in Jesus. Less than 50% of Americans said that they believe their faith was very important. By the way, do the math. 69% said they were Christians, but only 50% said it was important. If you're a Christian, it necessitates that that's important. Like, that doesn't make sense. 56% of Americans failed to attend any religious service, any religious service, like not even just Christian religious service, any religious service in the last, uh, what was it, the last month? Okay, clearly there needs to be an awakening. I think we agree with that. Y'all are in church, though, and most of y'all are professing Christians, okay? So to you, maybe we need revival, not awakening. Okay, I think there's clear, clearly evidence for a need for revival. Um, <clears throat> so here's what Barna found as he conducted research back in 2009. And the reason I'm okay with using 15-year-old research is because Barna went back about 30 years and the data suggested it was all flat over the last 30 years. So that's why I'm okay using 15-year-old data. He found that less than one out of 10 Americans had a biblical worldview. And whenever I say biblical worldview, his threshold for a biblical worldview was surprisingly low. Um, it's not like he set the bar so high that nobody could obtain this biblical worldview. No, no, he set a pretty reasonable goal for, a, for this worldview, okay? What he found was 46% of born-again adults believe in absolute moral truth. You all know what that means, right? That means that over half of Americans believe in any kind of absolute moral truth. More than half of them believe in some kind of relative thing, 79% of born-again Christians believe the Bible is accurate in all the principles that it teaches. Which means that one out of every five Christians, one out of every five Christians denies that the Bible is accurate in all its teachings. It's not saying, it's not, we're not even getting to the inerrant word. Like, he's not even talking about inerrancy yet. He's just saying it's, it's right in all its teachings. Like, not necessarily word for word, but in all the general principles that it teaches, it's right. One out of every five denies that. It just goes up as you get the inerrant word tied in there. 40%, 40% of born-again adults are convinced that Satan is a real force or being. 40% are convinced that Satan is a real force or being. More than half of born-again Christians will say Satan is not a real force or a being. Almost half of all born-again Christians, 47% if you want to know the number, almost half strongly reject the notion of earning salvation through their deeds, which means that over half believe that there is some kind of work necessary for you to earn salvation. 62% of born-again Christians are persuaded that Jesus lived a sinless life while he was on earth, which means that almost 40% of Christians in America believe that Jesus was guilty of some kind of sin. 
You all hear this, right? You see the problem. There is clearly not biblical thinking. And I think it's clear that there needs to be a recommitment amongst Christians to the very thing that we claim gives us hope, the thing that gives us life, and the thing that gives us meaning. The church in our day needs to be revived. We need revival. Now, the problem with that is, I think there's a misunderstanding of how revival is achieved. Um, if we, let's just stop and let's just ask, what is revival? Um, everybody loves dictionary definitions, so here's a couple. Oxford Dictionary says, The revival is a reawakening of religious fervor, especially by means of a series of evangelistic meetings. I think that's a decent definition. It's a revival. It's a new fervor for religious activity, especially by means of a series of gatherings, right? That's what we're going to do this week. Okay, is that what revival is? I think we're close. I don't think it's quite there, but I think we're close. Uh, Merriam-Webster, they say it's a period of renewed religious interest, period. New religious interest. Okay. So that's what revival is. All right. So where does it come from? How is it, a, how is it achieved? Um, well, the reason I want to ask, are we doing this right, is because I'm afraid that oftentimes in looking for revival, we look in the wrong places. Um, I think we look for a mystical feeling. Uh, y'all ever thought about that? Um, whenever we feel this tingly thing and there's, there's good music playing, and don't get me wrong, don't misunderstand, we're going to talk about good music here in a minute, but we, we look for that tingly feeling as like there's this breeze to blow by and that's, that's how we're revived whenever we experience good music or there's some really fiery preacher and that's revival whenever we get that tingly feeling. And again, I'm not attacking good music or a passionate speaker and I hope that we have both. Um, my point is, that according to the Bible, that's not revival. That's not how it's achieved. Is it through special meetings? Well, again, I hope and I pray that God uses these special meetings to bring about revival. Is that necessary for revival? Is that how revival is achieved according to scriptures? I'm going to say, no, not always. Do I hope God uses it? Sure, but is that revival? No. Does that mean that we need some special formula or some new insight? And that's a resounding no. Just so you know, there is no rigid formula we could put up to say, here's how we achieve revival. We do this, this, and this, and then we will experience revival. There is no checklist like that anywhere in the Bible. It doesn't exist. It just doesn't. Otherwise, we'd have revival all the time. If it was that easy, we would have it all the time. So instead, what we need to do is we need to retrain ourselves to think biblically about revival. Um, One author, many of you have probably heard of Tim Keller, he, I think he's helpful here, um, and I actually included his definition of revival in your study, guys. It, he said, revival is the intensification of the normal operations of the Holy Spirit. Conviction of sin, regeneration, and sanctification, assurance of salvation, through the ordinary means of grace, preaching of the word, prayer, etc. Revival is just an intensification of what God always does. And by the way, did you see the means he uses according to Keller there? The ordinary means of grace. See, what I hope that we find this week is that revival is not from the things that we deem extraordinary. That's not where it comes. Instead, God uses the unextraordinary things to shame the extraordinary. That's where revival comes. It's from these things that we look at and we're like, that's nothing special. But it really is. That's how God brings about revival. Um, I got that long quote in your study guide, and I want to share this with you, and I want to read through it, because I think Martin Lloyd-Jones is really helpful here. As he writes this, actually, he didn't write it. This was actually an excerpt from a sermon he preached that somebody else recorded. Um, I thought it was really insightful. He was, he was commenting on, on Genesis 26, 17, and 18, where Isaac went to find water to dig up wells. Um, and, and I thought this was really, really insightful. Here's what he said. He says, the the kind of thing you read constantly in the book and religious journals is this. We need, they say, what we need, they say, is a message for this atomic era or a message for this second Elizabethan period. And therefore, we must all be engaging in a quest for truth, a search for the message that is needed. So we call in the prospectors. We look to the scientists. We look to philosophy. And then psychology has its contribution to make. We call for the latest knowledge and learning. We want the very last advance in science and in culture in every shape and form. The whole idea is that the world is in a very serious predicament. And therefore, it behooves all men of understanding to come together and pool their resources, call a congress of world faiths, bring in everybody who believes in any religion and worships any sort of God. 
At the present time, the thing that is most obvious about the life of the church in general is the multiplicity of consciences. And there they are, trying to find the formula, trying to discover some word, trying to discover some message. It's this atomic age we're in, they say. We must have a message for it, and so on. Instead of doing what Isaac did, we are calling in the prospectors and water diviners trying to see if we can discover a source of, or supply of water somewhere that will enable us to continue. He goes on. He says, no, the emphasis in these verses is, I repeat, that Isaac did nothing of the kind. But what he did was this. Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. Why did he do this? Well, I think the wisdom of this is perfectly clear and quite obvious. Isaac realized that his situation was such that it was no time for experimentation. The position was so urgent that if they did not have water and that very quickly, they would all perish. And in such a position, he argued like this. There is no need for us to prospect and send for the water diviners. My father Abraham was once in this area. And if there was one thing that characterized Abraham above everything else, it was that he was an expert on this very question of finding water and sinking wells. Okay. I think Lloyd-Jones is on to something. He says, look, Isaac didn't go using everything else trying to find new water. He went back to the same place his father went before him. If we want living water, if we want revival... We don't need to go looking for some new formula. It's not something extraordinary or something that's way out there. Instead, we go back to the exact same places our fathers have gone before us. We go back and dig up the same wells. We have to stop searching for some new method or new revelation. Instead, go to the same place our fathers have always gone. So what do we do if we want revival? Go back to where our fathers went. Go back to the ministry of the word, prayer, and confession of sin. Now, I think we've established the problem a little bit. Um, I hope you see the problem. We need revival, and uh, maybe we're looking in some of the wrong places, going about it the wrong ways. Um, I've told you the biblical solution is to go back to the same wells our fathers had. Um, what I would like to do with the rest of our time together this morning is actually go to the Word and establish the same point. Um, so I'm going to show you the same thing just through God's Word. So if you have a Bible with you, and I hope that you do, um, it, it's, I believe it's in your study guides, but uh, if you have a Bible, open it to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 will be our text for the rest of the morning. Um, and I'd invite you to stand out of respect for reading God's Word. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says this. Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Thank God for his word. You may be seated. I think what we find as we look at this is that there are these certain elements that are necessary for us, that are essential if we want to see revival. Okay? And that's what I would like to focus on with the rest of this time. Okay? First is the biblical revival. It requires a recognition of God's previous methods. Okay? Biblical revival, it requires a recognition of God's previous methods. Right? Hebrews 12 here starts by saying, Therefore, since we have this large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, and I hope you all see this picture, okay? It's this, it's this giant stadium, all right? So I thought, about, I thought about this as I was considering the track and running a race. I thought about Mountain City's track, which, by the way, nice, beautiful new track over here. It looks great. They got the nice stands. That's not what I picture whenever I picture Hebrews 12. I picture an Olympic arena with fans all over the place, like just packing the stands. Um, some of you all know this, but I, I, ran, I ran track in high school, um, that doesn't mean I was good, but I ran track in high school. Um, and I ran long distance. Um, I, I ran primarily the two mile, and I was exceptionally mediocre, like just okay-ish. Um, that's where I was at. Um, some of you all have run track. Some of you all know what it's like. And I, I'll just tell you, though, as I'm running eight laps around this track, the easiest part of the whole race to run 
was the home stretch. That was the easiest part of the whole race. Right? Because as you're running this race, it's one thing whenever you're on the backside and you're all by yourself and you're all alone and all you can think about is you're breathing and it's my, are my strides right? Am I, am I keeping my pace? And that's all you're thinking about. But then you circle and you come up to the home stretch where you've got the stands here and people are cheering you on and you hear, come on, you got it. Keep going, keep going, come on. Okay, um, actually, my, my dad was my track coach. He was a real meanie. Um, I wanted to say something meaner than that, but um, he wasn't very nice to me. Um, actually, he was incredibly generous with me. He should have been meaner. Um, but I remember even my dad was there uh, down close on that home stretch, close to the finish line, and he would always have a stopwatch out. And as I was coming by, he'd say, okay, you're a few seconds behind the pace. You just need to just pick it up a little bit. Okay, you got, you got to go a little bit harder here. Just come on, press on. And the most, the easiest part of the whole race, the freest part of the whole race is that home stretch. Because you have this support, you have this encouragement, you feel like these people are almost running this race with you. They're carrying you as you're running this race. And that's what I picture as I read this. Now, um, I always, here, this, you'll, you'll get a kick out of this. I always thought it was funny whenever dad stopped saying, hey, you're two seconds behind pace or something like that, because I knew what that meant. If he wasn't giving me times, that meant, Jared, you're way behind your pace here. You, like, you got to cut 30 seconds off somewhere. Um, anyway, I just always thought that was funny. If he was quiet, that meant, I'm not doing so hot. Um, but that's the picture here. Running this race, coming around, and he says, look, you're running this race of life, and you're surrounded by this large crowd of witnesses. These people around you, cheering you on. Um, saying, come on. I know you're struggling right now. I know it's hard. I know that physically maybe you're not doing well. I know that you're just depressed emotionally. I know that you're struggling, but press on. Like, you've got this. You can do this. And he says, therefore, since we have this, which actually points us backward, it points us back to chapter 11, which is one of the most famous verse, or one of the most famous chapters in the whole Bible. Most of you are familiar with Hebrews 11, even if you don't know, it's called the Hall of Faith, right? There's hero after hero after hero of the faith, one after the another. And it's like, it's almost like the author of Hebrews here is saying, look at all these heroes. They're surrounding you, urging you on, press, like saying, press on, carry on. And he says, look, there's Abel who offered a better sacrifice than Cain. He came and he was approved by God. Like he brought this better sacrifice. He's there saying, come on, you can do this. You've got it. There's Enoch who did not experience death because he walked with God. Saying walk with God. There's Noah who built the ark and was delivered from the flood. All by faith, right? Noah who was looked at as a crazy person because it never rained at this point. And here's Noah out building a boat. What's wrong with you, Noah? He says, my God says it's going to rain. I believe my God. I'm going to press on with what he's called me to. There's Abraham who followed God's call to go to a distant land. Didn't make sense. Wouldn't you want to stay where your family was, where they had ground, where they had land, and you could inherit it? No. God called him to a distant land, and Abraham went because he knew that his God was faithful. God said he was going to do something. He was going to do it, so he went. Sarah, who believed that God could give her a son, even in her old age. There she is. There she is as a witness to our faithfulness, saying, press on in your faith. People all around me told me I was nuts. I was 90 years old. I wasn't going to have a baby. That's not going to happen. He says, she's telling you, like, keep pressing on. It may not make sense to you. Why would you have faith in this God who seems so distant? Are you kidding me? Sarah says, no, I had a baby when I was 90 years old. I'm going to press on. She witnesses to us. Abraham was willing to sacrifice even his promised son. Why would you go to that crazy place? That doesn't make sense. Why would you do that? Well, Abraham's saying, look, I thought it was crazy when God told me to go to Mount Moriah and kill my son. It didn't make sense to me. This was a promised son that was supposed to have generation after generation, as numerous as the stars of the sky, sand on the seashore. God had promised me all this. And now he's telling me to go kill my son, kill my heir. But I believed God. I believed what he said was true. So I was willing to do this thing that didn't make sense to anybody else. And he testifies to us. He testifies to us that God is faithful. <laughs> And then there's Isaac, there's Jacob, there's Moses, there's Joshua, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. And he even goes on, the author of Hebrews even says, there's not enough time to talk about all these people who persevered by faith, but they witnessed to us, telling us, press on. Like, just picture this. 
Have you all ever thought about this? As you're running this race of life and you're coming down the home stretch and here's Moses saying, look, people thought I was crazy whenever I said there, here's this bush burning and God's voice came from it and it wasn't consumed, but I believed God. And you know what Moses saw after that? Moses went to a pagan king and said, you're going to let these slaves go because my God said you would. And guess what he did? He let, it, he let the people go. You all know the process, but and he's telling you, look, persevere in your faith. Believe God at his word. Why would we look anywhere else when we have this large crowd of witnesses around us saying, don't look to anything else. Look to God. Look to him. Look to his word. He's faithful. He's true. We don't need a new word. We have these witnesses around us saying, press on. Keep going. And all these are biblical examples of people who persevered by faith. But I I don't believe that what, what the author of Hebrews is doing is laying out an exclusive list. I think that misses the point because he even says there's not enough time for everybody else. And I'll be honest with you, there are heroes of the faith in my mind that are just as great as these. And as some of you are thinking I'm nuts, I picture my grandmother as one of those people who is cheering me on saying, Jared, persevere by faith. Some of you are thinking, Jared, you're putting your grandmother on the same plane as Abraham. Yeah, actually I am. You can call me a heretic for that if you want, but my grandmother persevered by faith. Because she believed God at his word and wasn't willing to sacrifice. So I look at my grandmother's life and I believe that she was convinced, firmly convinced to the day she died, that Jesus was her God and her Savior. And she was willing to do anything to glorify him. And her faith witnesses to us. We're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. But in one sense, I'm going to contradict myself. The witnesses are different. Um, R.T. France, he comments on this word witnesses because in our, in our English, um, many of you have heard the word martyr. That's the word for witnesses here in Hebrews. R.T. France says, they are witnesses because their lives, and in some cases their death, their deaths, witnessed to the unconquerable faith in God for which they were condemned. But they are also, as those who trusted God and whose faith has been vindicated, witnesses to the reliability of God's promises. These men and women, this great cloud, they testify to the goodness, to the faithfulness, and to the righteousness of our God. Like, when we want revival, why would we look anywhere else? We want revival. We go to these same wells because we see these people who persevered in the race. Go to them, see how they persevered. Understand what they did. So let's look to the same things as our ancestors. Let's rely on his word and his promise and obey him, even or maybe even especially when it seems difficult or impossible. Rely on him and his word. I think biblical revival requires a recognition of God's previous methods. Um, But second, it also requires perseverance in pursuit of holiness. A perseverance in pursuit of holiness. Um, The passage says, Therefore, since we have this large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, Let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. It starts by saying, lay aside every hindrance. And this was a removal of everything that could impede performance, right? I think about a runner. You don't see distance runners going out to run a marathon wearing these heavy clothes. Or You all ever picked up running shoes? They're so light. It's like you have nothing there. Why is that? Well, because you don't want these things burdening you as you're running a race. You want to shed all the pounds you possibly can, right? So, running a race rem- requires a removal of all those things that could hinder our ability to do so. And it requires a continual renewing as we strive to remove all of these things that hold us back. And the point isn't that we're condemned because of these things. That's not what he says at all. He says so that we can increase speed. We can increase performance. We can run it more faithfully. Um, our sin has been paid for. It's been forgiven and removed through the person and work of Jesus. So, if we're looking for revival, I'm not talking about, hey... You need to be born again. No, you've already been born again. Instead, it's shedding the extra weight. Um, Our sin prevents us from running the race well, from accomplishing the task that he's laid before us. Um, I don't believe it's a matter of losing salvation, but a matter of losing effectiveness in the race. Um, Now, we could 
cover a whole bunch of things. And I think the word here um, for hindrance, it actually carries a lot of ideas. It carries the idea of extra bodily weight or things that could be carried to warn. And really, I think what is being imagined here is this, this long garment that would often hang down and tangle in people's feet as they're running. And he says, let's, let's remove that hindrance. Let's tie it up. Let's, let's fix that. Um, see, I, I imagine, actually, I'm quite certain that many of us fail to run the race well because we're carrying all these things that weigh us down. Um, we're carrying an awful lot of extra baggage. Um, we carry guilt, the shame, the habitual sin that prevents us from running full steam ahead. But what this cloud does, this cloud that surrounds us, um, those who have gone before us, they urge us to lay aside those hindrances, those doubts, that shame, that guilt, those things that caused them pain, heartache, embarrassment, and ineffectiveness. Like, specifically, I already know I already talked about Moses, but I think about Moses here, laying aside those things, that, th those hindrances. See, Moses, whenever the burning, at the burning bush, right, Moses told God no. Essentially, I know it was kind of a roundabout way. He said, but God, I don't speak well. <laughs> God, I've got this burden here. I've got this problem with your plan, God, and it's not going to work. God, I can't do this. And you know how easy it would have been for Moses to look at him and say, God, I, don't, I think you got the wrong guy. Right? Like, I was raised in Pharaoh's household. That's not, that's not a good look for me now going back and telling him he's wrong. Oh, and what's more than that is, I killed one of his people. Like, I'm a murderer. I messed up and I killed a guy. So, God, you've got the wrong guy. It's not right. He had to lay aside the hindrance, those things that could trip him up, keep him from being effective in the mission that God gave him. He says, no, no, no. Persevere in the pursuit of holiness. Lay aside those things, those problems. Lay them aside. They're not worth it. All they're going to do is trip you up. And I believe that many in the church throw up their hands and say, well, I'm never going to be perfect. Right? Y'all ever felt that before? Like, I know that this side, this side of eternity, I'm, never, like, I'm not going to be, I'm not perfect. I'm not a perfect man. I'm only human. So we almost just throw our hands up and we're like, well, I can't do it anyway. <laughs> Why try? Are you, are you kidding me? No. No. No, you won't be perfect in this life, but pursue holiness because those who have gone before us testify to the significance of laying aside those hindrances. They show us how awesome God can, like, how awesome the things that God can do are if we lay aside those burdens. Lay them aside. Lay them aside. If we want to experience biblical revival, it requires a recognition of the previous methods and perseverance in the pursuit of holiness. And then third, it requires an emphasis on Christ and his glory requires an emphasis on Christ and his glory. Now, this is backwards to us because we're looking for revival for me. The funny thing about revival is it becomes to where it's not about me. Um, he says, we do all of this keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. In other words, Jesus is our supreme example of life and perseverance. He's our supreme example. You want to know what life and perseverance look like? Look to Jesus. He's that one. But I think it's more than that. See, here the author of Hebrews says that he is the source and perfecter of our faith. And the word source, uh, in some of your translations, it likely says pioneer or author of our faith. Um, Jesus certainly did run the race before us, and he shows us how it should be run. Right? He's our perfect example of life and holiness. Perfect example. But he is also the author, the source, the originator, the beginning of our faith. He's where it begins. Right? Like, we don't have faith because we're good. We have faith because of who Jesus is and what he's done, the work he's accomplished. See, our faith comes from him. He's where it originates. And not only that, but he's also the perfecter. He's the one that completes our faith. Right? We don't, we don't just come to the good news of Jesus so that we can enter into the kingdom. No, we come to Jesus not only for the entrance, but also for the life, for building, for sanctification, for becoming more and more like the perfect man that he is. Like we come to him for all of it. We look to Jesus, the author and the perfecter. In him we find fulfillment, we find meaning, we find life. It's in Jesus that we find revival. It's in him, not someplace else. It's in him that we find revival. And notice that once he finished the race, see what he did? He sat down, indicating his work was finished, and he sat down at the right hand of God, this position of authority, this position of power. 
ensuring that he will not fail or leave his work undone. Jesus finished the race. If we want to do the same, if we want to finish the race and finish it well, what do we do? We keep our eyes fixed on him. We keep our eyes fixed on him. Um, funny thing about running a distance, um, I don't know how many times I drop my head. Um, which, okay, maybe, that, maybe that's a good thing. But oftentimes I was so worried about keeping myself from being distracted that I never even looked to the finish line. It was always looking down. Instead of straining ahead, I was just saying, I've got to take the next step. Which, okay, maybe there's some wisdom to that, but that's not what, that's not what we do. We look to the goal. We look to the finish line and strain for it, longing for the finish line. We look to Jesus, keep our eyes fixed on him. If we want true revival, then we cannot be man-centered. We cannot be focused on ourselves. We cannot be focused on us. We have to be focused on Christ. Not seeking some, I don't know, this, maybe this is a little sarcastic, but the feel-good tinglys, right? I've wanted those. I just want to feel good. Like, I want the tingly feeling, that cool breeze. I want the emotional high. But instead of seeking those, we need to... It, what we find is that we experience revival when we recenter on Christ, on Jesus and his completed, completed work and his glory. That's where we find revival. That's where we find awakening. It's not focusing on us, it's focusing on Christ. And when we want nothing more than for Christ to be glorified in us, then we experience revival. Whenever we have a soul focus on him. So it requires an emphasis on Christ and his glory. Well, so what? Okay. <clears throat> The point I'm going to get at this morning and the point I want to get at all week, and maybe this is incredibly simplistic, I'm good with that because I'm a pretty simple guy, is that if we, want, if we want to see real revival or if we want to see real awakening, we need to look to these common places. That's where revival is found. It's not found in the extraordinary, but instead God uses the unextraordinary to shame the extraordinary. He uses these common places. So as we continue on this week, we're going to ask the question, are we doing this right? And we're going to look at revival in our lives. We're going to look at revival in marriages and in our families. We're going to look at revival in the church. And we're going to ask, are we doing this right? And I think what we'll find is whenever we do revival according to God's way found in his word, it has a tremendous impact on all of those areas. Um, so what we'll do over the next few days is we're going to go back to the same wells that our fathers dug before us. We're going to go back to those same wells again and again and again. And we're going to pray and we're going to trust that God's going to give us the same living water that they found. That we're going to experience life in revival, not because of some new formula, but because our fathers knew where it was found. And they showed us the way and they testify to us. They are witnesses to us. Um, now, <clears throat> one more thing before I, before I tie a bow on this and we, we call it good. Um, it's going to be tempting to think, if we're just disciplined enough, we'll experience revival. It's going to be tempting to think that. Um, and I understand. And don't misunderstand. Discipline is a good thing. It is a good thing. It's beneficial for us. However, I want to be cautious. Because again, I'm not laying down some rigid formula to follow and saying discipline is enough. Because it is absolutely not. Um, we need God to do what only God can do. Um, I actually want to share this with you about um, John Wesley because I think his life actually is a good testament to this. Um, we are going to need humility and we're going to need an act of God if we're going to experience revival. But John Wesley, um, his story is a little bit different than most of ours and here's, here's something I came across on his life. It says, in light of his own assessment, it seems the best explanation for Wesley's fear of death and ineffectiveness in ministry is that although he had been trained as a clergyman and was involved in the spiritual disciplines, he had not truly come to faith in Christ for himself. He wrote in his journal on December 2nd of 1737, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? Spiritual disciplines such as prayer, Bible reading, and fasting are helpful for a believer to strengthen and deepen a relationship with Christ. But if a, if a, per, but if a person has not come to faith in Christ and been born again by the Spirit of God first, then no amount of spiritual discipline will ever bring about spiritual life. In fact, the road to hell can be paved with spiritual disciplines and good deeds. You can be as disciplined as you want, but unless God does a work in you, you're not going to be saved. 
You need God to work in you to experience revival, to experience awakening. So we're going to go to the same wells, and I pray that we'll find that same living water, that God will bring life to you, that he will revive you, and that you will experience this new religious fervor, this renewed religious fervor in your lives. Um, I look forward to our time together over the next few days. Would you pray with me? <coughs> Father, <coughs> um, I thank you for this large cloud of witnesses. Lord, I, as I was studying this, I wondered what it would have been like to be able, um, to be able, who brought you the better sacrifice, um, and have such a small cloud of witnesses, to not have this long lineage of faithful followers and how it might have been difficult to just simply have Adam there saying, persevere, persevere. Um, Lord, I am thankful, however, that you've placed us where we are and I'm thankful for the testimony of our fathers before us. Um, Lord, I'm thankful for the way that they testify to your faithfulness and your goodness. Lord, and I pray that we would look to those same places that they did and we would experience the same life that they did, that we would experience the same hope, the same passion, the same, um, the same just, just like consumption. Like, Lord, they were totally consumed with you. Lord, I pray that we would experience that same thing in our lives because of these ordinary means of grace because of your word, because of prayer, because of confession of sin. God, I pray that we would be renewed and we would be restored. And Lord, I pray that we would have a passion to follow you and be totally unashamed of the gospel. So Lord, I pray this morning that you would do a work. But Lord, I also pray that over the coming days that you would continue to move in us. Lord, and that in the end, you might move through us. That we might see many revived, but many awakened also. So God, I pray that you would do the work that only you can do. And we ask it all in Jesus' name.